Welcome to a special Veterans Day Town Hall Q&A event with Secretary Dennis McDonough. I'm Jose Yamas with the Veterans Experience Office, and I'll be the moderator for today's Q&A. Due to the pandemic and taking necessary precautions to limit in-person gatherings, we've pre-recorded this town hall using real questions from veterans, families, caregivers, and survivors to share with you today. Secretary McDonough will be addressing several questions today on topics ranging from claims to COVID and caregivers to survivors. In February 2021, the Honorable Dennis McDonough was nominated by President Biden as the 11th Secretary of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Secretary McDonough served as the 26th White House Chief of Staff from February 2013 to January 2017. Prior to his role as Chief of Staff, Mr. McDonough was Principal Deputy National Security Advisor from October 2010 to January 2013. He also served as the Chief of Staff of the National Security Staff and as the Deputy National Security Advisor for Strategic Communications. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for joining us today. But before we begin, I would like to ask you, what does Veterans Day mean to you? Well, Jose, thanks so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be here today, and uh, I'm really looking forward to the conversation. You know, um, Veterans Day really means to me uh, two things. It's an opportunity for us to pause and remember uh, and refresh the amazing stories and the um, critical role of veterans in this country. Just look back on the last year and, and think to yourself, uh, all the things that we as a country asked veterans to help us on, on managing the pandemic, on uh, coming back from the pandemic to ensure we have economic growth, on helping us get uh, interpreters and other allies, SIV holders out of Afghanistan and now helping us ensure that as they're resettled here in the United States that uh, veterans watch out for them. So one, it's an important opportunity to pause and remember and reflect. But it's also a moment for us to refresh, we as a country, to refresh what President Biden calls our sacred obligation, which is uh, to care for our men and women in uniform and their families when they come home. When we make that commitment to them, to you, uh, and to fellow veterans, that if they have our back, we'll have theirs. If they stand and fight for us, we're gonna fight for them. And so Veterans Day is not just an opportunity to reflect, it's also an opportunity to refresh that sacred obligation to make sure that we're doing our part. And I know we'll get into a lot of this in the discussion now, but um, the things that really motivate me in that regard are, are we providing access to timely access to world-class health care? Are we providing timely access to earned benefits? Are we ensuring that veterans are getting access to mental health care? And are we doing everything we can, for example, to end veterans' homelessness? Um, that's what Veterans Day means to me. I appreciate you sharing that with us today. A refresh. It's been a challenging year for all of us. Yeah. And I think it's very refreshing to yeah. refresh as an organization yeah. helping our veterans. Yeah. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing Absolutely. that. Absolutely. It's look, it's an, it's an unbelievable opportunity to have this job, uh, to get to work with you. Uh, and not everybody can see this, but there's an unbelievable team here in the studio. That's right. Uh, led by Ed and, you know, Earl, Patrick, Larry, you know, the team's unbelievable in here. Be able to, uh, to be able to work with you all to mm -hmm. carry out this sacred obligation is a blessing like no other, and it's the uh, best job I've had in my life, and um, uh, really important work worth doing, and I'm thrilled to be part of the team. Yeah, we do have a great team, not only here, but all across the country. Amen. Well, sir, with that, let's go into our first question. The first question is from a Marine Corps veteran, Vic Burke, and he asks, Many veterans complain about substandard care at many VA facilities. 
What and when is the government going to fix this issue? A veteran contemplating suicide can't wait two months for a mental health counselor's calendar to open. A phone call to a suicide hotline is nothing compared to an in-person visit. Yeah. Well, uh, let me just say to Vic, um, everything he writes in that question is um, uh, undeniably true, and I'm not going to rebut it. Uh, I'm going to I'm, I'm going to accept it as a challenge to us here, um, because everything he does say is true. That is that is true that there is complaints about substandard care. Um, we've seen satisfaction ratings increase. In fact, we see them today at um, around 90% for outpatient care, 90% satisfaction rate. That should be the floor, not the ceiling. That should be the floor. Mm -hmm. So um, we have to keep driving toward fulfilling that goal I mentioned a minute ago, which is timely access to world-class care. The way we do that is by being nimble and responsive as an organization. So on the issue that Vic raises and what I'd urge our veterans out there to, re to remember is if you are in an emergency situation and you contact us on the veteran crisis line today, in an emergency situation, we can get you in to see someone today. If it's not quite an emergency, but it's urgent, we can get you in in under two days. So if you are in crisis, know that we're here for you. And our ability to deliver on that, Jose, underscores to me an important point, which is if we can continue to deliver on emergent care, emergency care, and urgent care, then we can do a better job on care overall. So uh, th we have all sorts of statistics I could give you, but I'm not going to find um, solace in the statistics because those are averages. Mm -hmm. And the problem with averages is obviously there's outliers. And I want to make sure that we're working for the outlier. I just saw a video online today about um, a sailor in California who is struggling to get, he's struggling to travel a long distance to get his care for back uh, pain and even uh, significant degeneration in his, mm -hmm. uh, in his back. So I don't want to take solace in the averages when I know that there's outliers. I want to make sure that we're working through everything we can do to get vets in the door to be seen. But just to reiterate one more time to our veterans who may find themselves in an emergency situation, if you contact us today and you're in an emergency, we will see you today. So if you call the Veterans Crisis Line in an emergency or in an urgent situation, We'll get you in to see someone today in an emergency within two days in an urgent situation. And we will share some numbers uh, at the end of this uh, program uh, for the veterans and the families that are watching. Great. So thank you very much for, for mentioning that today. Absolutely. We'll go to our next question, sir, and it's from a veteran caregiver, Melissa uh, Cuomo. And her question is, if a caregiver is ineligible for the program of comprehensive assistant for family caregivers, what other options for support are available? How is the VA planning on making the access and scheduling of community care easier for veterans and their caregivers? Excellent question. So there's two questions there. Uh, let's set aside the scheduling uh, question for a second. If uh, we have caregivers who don't qualify for the new requirements for the caregiver program, there is a program of general caregiver support which you will then qualify for that allows you as a caregiver even if you're not uh, in the full program of uh, um, benefits and monthly support to get uh, training education mm -hmm. and support options so um, we're going through this period now where we're uh, given the new law from Congress, we're going back to look at whether uh, 
caregivers who had qualified for the legacy program will continue in this new program that Congress has started. That process itself will allow us to get in touch with caregivers uh, and family members to make sure that you're available, that you're, you're aware of all the options that are available. Um, but it also makes sure that we have an opportunity uh, to hear, not only for us to talk to you, but for us to hear from you about what your needs are. So that's the first thing. If you don't qualify for the full program, you will qualify for uh, the uh, program of general caregiver support. Secondly, on scheduling. Um, this has been a source of some um, controversy over time. And this, like the first question, is something we just have to do better. And let me give you some examples of where we are doing better. On access to vaccinations during COVID-19, the real secret weapon there in getting our veterans scheduled for the vaccine and caregivers scheduled for their vaccine is the cadre of schedulers, the MSAs, the medical support assistants that we have across the system. Mm -hmm. And to see how they excelled and the way they uh, worked to track down veterans, track down caregivers, is an example of the excellence that we can expect and should expect across the full range of support services that we offer at VA. And so the bottom line is um, we are uh, improving both our, the timeliness of our payments and the timeliness of referrals under the community care program. Uh, it's now time for us to not only continue to that, uh, but also improve timeliness of scheduling and then maintaining a full and robust network of support. Um, as we do that, and we're getting better at each of those steps, as we do that, veterans, caregivers, survivors, family members will have the kind of programming that they are right to expect. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, uh, our caregivers are so important for our veterans every single day and all across the country. You know, I just, uh, I just talked with um, Senator Elizabeth Dole and the Dole Foundation on Friday mm -hmm. in the annual uh, caregiver conference. And it's such an uh, inspiring group of people. It really is. You know, mm -hmm. if there's anybody who exemplifies President Lincoln's call to service for veterans, it's our caregivers. Mm -hmm. You know, um, referred to, I think rightly, too often as hidden heroes. Um, heroes undeniably, but too often not seen. But those days are over in the VA. Uh, we see you, we appreciate you, we are here for you. It doesn't mean we're perfect on everything and you're right to expect more of us. Um, but let's make sure we're focusing and making true our support to the heroes and let's uh, make sure that you no longer feel like the hidden heroes that you've been. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that. Our next question comes from a Navy veteran, Mr. Steven Lundgren, and he asks, will the VA require veterans get the COVID-19 vaccine and any boosters as a condition of receiving health care treatment from the VA? No, no, we will not. Uh, well, here's, so Steven, in, in direct response to your question, no, we will not. Um, full stop. Let me say something that I have decided to do, and I have decided to do this because it's so important to ensure the safety of veteran patients. And I am requiring us, we who work for you veterans here at VA, to be vaccinated. And I'm requiring that we get vaccinated so that you, as our veteran patients or our veteran clients, or as I like to say it, our veteran bosses, since we work for you, can have every confidence that we've taken every step we possibly can to ensure that uh, we can warranty your safety when you come in. 
And so uh, that's why I have taken the step of requiring that we, those of us who work for you here at VA, uh, are required to get that vaccine. Mm -hmm. Veterans uh, who come in for care will not be required to get it. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. And I know that's uh, important for us, as you mentioned, and yeah. all of us have uh, taken the pledge and uploaded all of our information so that yeah. everyone in the in the organization knows that we have been vaccinated. Yeah, it's great. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, I'm, I'm really inspired. I think VA, it's, in so many ways, VA is leading the way. Throughout the pandemic, VA has led the way. Um, and in the very, um, I think, profound way that we've taken on this leadership role is true mm -hmm. as it relates to our own vaccination as well. So yeah. I know there's questions for s some of our um, colleagues about uh, the vaccine. If you still have questions about it, make sure that uh, you get with uh, the docs or nurses um, that if you have questions about um, the usefulness of the vaccine, we'll answer those questions. And what we're finding is when people ask the questions, um, they get the answers that help them uh, feel comfortable taking the vaccine. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. The next question comes from an anonymous veteran. And the veteran asks, can you talk about burn pits and why it takes so long to establish presumptive conditions? Why join the burn pit registry? It's a great question. Um, and it's one, frankly, I've been wrestling with myself. Uh, since arriving here at VA. Um, and um, what, I, what I would say is, that, you know, when I was up in uh, East Orange at our uh, VA Medical Center up there where we have our uh, Center for Excellence on Burn Pit, uh, on uh, toxic exposure, some of the best, most accomplished scientists in the country working on this question. And I said to him, uh, what, what is the missing piece of information that we need to just close this loop? Um, because as you may have heard me say, or as some of uh, our, our teammates watching may have heard me say, I said uh, last week in the press that I think the fact that only this summer, uh, the fact that we've only just this summer, a couple of months ago, begun adjudicating claims for toxic exposure, even though we've been fighting, you've been fighting, in that swath of geography from Somalia, northeast, uh, to Uzbekistan, with everything from Iraq and Afghanistan, Syria in between, is, I believe, a failing of the, go of the federal government. And I want to correct that. But when I asked the scientists, you know, what's the what's the one, the missing piece? They said, "Listen, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has been uh, administration, Environmental Protection Administration, has been trying for decades to establish some of these causal links." Um, and it stands to reason. I get it, um, but I feel the urgency on this which is why what we've done now is basically three things. And this is tied into the next part of the question, which is the first thing. Why, the veteran asks, why participate in the burn pit registry? Here's why. Your filing, your claim, gives us important information about you and perhaps other people in your unit and what you ex what you experience. Mm -hmm. For too long, we have not taken that information, those individual claims. By law, we, we study that claim and make a determination about that claim as that claim. And that's a good first step. But I want to take all of the claims that come in, maybe everybody in your unit, and we, and we uh, aggregate those together, and we're able to extrapolate information about what you experience. So that's why filing your claim, and that's why participating in the burn pit registry is so important, is it helps us take your personal experience, aggregate it, and hopefully use that information to speed this process along. That's one thing we've done. Second thing we've done is 
for too long, VA has only waited for one lane of science from the National Academies of Science. Mm. I think the National Academies is great. But the idea that we would just wait for one source of science rather than go ask DOD, ask Department of Labor where we have OSHA, ask HHS, the Health and Human Services, which oversees the National Institutes of Health, mm. including the National Institute of Cancer. Um, the fact that uh, we hadn't asked the firefighters, for example, they know something about toxic exposure, right? Mm. We're taking all that science and we're aggregating that along with the individual experience to try to speed this along. And then the third thing is, I'm saying, we need some urgency on this. Yeah. Right? We mm -hmm. just, we can't wait. We can't make vets have to be their own advocates. The president said to me, you got to fight like hell for vets. You have to be the number one advocate for veterans. Well, that's my job. And if I'm not doing that, then, um, then they should get at somebody in here who is. I can feel it in your in your voice and the way you explain it. And you're right; it is important for the for veterans to register to yeah. help other veterans out. Yeah. Bottom line. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, and I, I know it can be frustrating. And my guess is it's uh, not only frustrating but time consuming and a hassle. Um, it might even be in some cases traumatic to yeah. have to go back and and rethink some of this and relive some of this. Um, but I want you to know that your input is really important for your case, but we are getting better at using the aggregation of that data and those experiences to, to have that have an impact on everybody's cases. So I, I hope we can get uh, more and more of our vets to do it. Yeah, me too. Thank you. The next question comes from Army veteran Harmony Cannon. And the question is, <clears throat> Will the VA eventually cover sex reassignment surgery? Yeah, it's a really good question. Mm -hmm. So um, earlier this year, um, I did announce that um, we are beginning the steps to be in a position to um, uh, offer gender confirmation surgery at VA. Uh, even before that, we were offering all of the services other than gender confirmation surgery for uh, veterans who are uh, experiencing uh, or going through um, uh, gender dysphoria. And so it makes sense that we take this next step. Now, I think two things are really important well, three things really are really important about this. Um, the way we'll do this, that is to say, solidify how we offer this service, is we'll do it through public comment, through rulemaking. So this will be a very public process so that anybody with questions about it, anybody with concerns about it, can be heard in the public rulemaking process. That's one. This won't be secret behind closed doors. This will be something that we do publicly, informed by um, best practice, informed by most, uh, the most recent data science, um, and informed by public comment. Mm -hmm. Second, the thing that really struck me about this decision is I remember reading a memo uh, from Dr. Stone it had a sentence in the memo that said, it is the uniform consensus recommendation of the VHA governing board that we take this step. Meaning, the clinicians who oversee the care that we give here, the best care in the world for veterans, uniformly and unanimously agree with this step. And among the reasons why is that veterans wrestling with gender dysphoria who have access to this service are much less likely to suffer from depression and therefore much 
are much less likely to die by suicide if we have this service. So that's the second thing. It is a fundamental priority of the clinicians, informed by their medical experience, and informed by what we know now about the mental health impact. Third, when the president asked me, well, the president doesn't really ask questions, right? You, you know this better than anybody as a Marine, right? The, the line between questions and orders is pretty thin line. Mm -hmm. and if, so when the president asks me a question, there's one answer to the question, right? The, the answer is yes. So when he asked me to take this job, I said absolutely yes. He said to me, you have to be a fierce advocate. You have to fight like hell for veterans. He didn't say you have to fight like hell for some vets. He didn't say you have to fight like hell for the World War II vets and the Korea vets, mm -hmm. the Vietnam vets. He said you have to fight like hell for all vets. And believe me, there's plenty of days where I wonder whether I'm up to such a huge task because it's such a body of unbelievable people who literally raised their right hand and said, I will give everything I have for this country. So to think that you're up to the task for fighting like hell for those people mm -hmm. who have fought like hell for us, it's daunting. But I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it for every vet, homeless vet, gay vet, straight vet, white, black, white vet, black vet, male vet, female vet. That's my job, every single one. Yeah. And this is an example of us doing that, not at the cost of anybody else but fundamentally in support of that veteran who raised their right hand and said, I'll do it. Yeah, that's, um, <clears throat> you're right. But I think the really, the really important thing is for when it is open for comment for our veterans to really let it be known. Yes. And voice what their opinions are. Absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. Mm -hmm. I, I'll say it again. I'll say, I, it's an important concept, maybe it's corny, but we work here for you, for the veterans, the caregivers, the families, the survivors. That's who we work for. So what you say matters. What our clinicians say about how best to care for you matters. So make your voices heard. Absolutely. Thank you. The next question comes from Army veteran Will Benson. And Will asks, why does the VA make it so difficult to refile a disability claim after being denied? It seems like a, it's a lost cause to file for a claim I've previously been denied for. Yeah. Well, we do use a common application for the claims. Uh, we are uh, constantly learning and proving how we um, review those documents, how we um, ease the process for veterans to file the, the claims. Uh, that's one. Two, um, there are increasing requirements by, imposed by statute mm -hmm. for us to require a high le higher level review of an appealed claim. Um, so we're getting better there, too. And then third is um, you also, under the appeals modernization, have the process where you can appeal your claim uh, to the board. And so I know it's tiring. Uh, I know it can feel haphazard. But we are investing heavily in training our claims reviewers. We're, heavily, we're investing heavily in the technology to inform not only that training, but the review itself. Mm -hmm. We're looking at ways where we can automate these decisions in as much as we have a good understanding, rather than make 
vets have to refile or submit to additional um, exams. Um, let's take a look at the information we have. So we're considering that too. Um, and you as vets have right to appeal, including to the board, for higher level review. And so I say what I've said now a couple times is I'm not saying it's easy and I'm not saying we do it perfectly, but I am saying that you're our bosses and we'll continue to improve the way we're doing our business and we'll continue to make that transparent in how we do it. Um, and I hope you'll continue to press us to do it better. Yeah, important to stay on top of <clears throat> everything going on in our veterans' lives and yeah. what affects them. And we do have a dedicated staff there to help them yes. through this whole process. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. The next question is from Army veteran Ken Steinhoff. And Ken asks, will the VA be taking into consideration the high inflation rate this year to give us a bigger cost of living adjustment? Rent alone has jumped up 50%. So please tell me, we are getting a bigger adjustment this year. Yeah, it's a good question. And yeah. so at the end of the day, we don't decide what the adjustment is every year. The Consumer Price Index, which uh, is set uh, by federal policymakers outside of VA, um, informs what the cost of living adjustment will be for Social Security, for Medicare, um, for example. And so this year, uh, that adjustment is going to be 5.9%. So you will be seeing a very consequential increase uh, in the cost of living adjustment. Um, that's the highest it's been in decades. The, I, I'm not suggesting that um, that's the answer to all the challenges, including rent going up 50%. Uh, but I am saying that you will see a cost of living adjustment. Um, and if you find yourself uh, in a tough spot on rent, just remember that we have rent support options available to you too. Uh, and make sure you get in touch with us if you find yourself in a tough spot there um, because uh, we do have additional options over and above the increase in the cost of living adjustment. Yeah, I think a lot of veterans don't know about that benefit yeah. to them. Uh, so thank you for mentioning that. Yeah. You know, that's especially now during this time with that question. Well, we see it, and, and the fact is that one of the things that VA has done really well for years is um, helping intervene before a veteran finds themselves homeless. Mm -hmm. So if you find yourself squeezed by rent, um, if you're having trouble managing uh, mortgage or um, utility payments. Make sure you get in touch with us and help us walk. We'll help walk through some options for you. But in all cases, the cost of living adjustment is coming. Yeah, and it's important to ask for help. Amen. When someone needs help, right? Amen. The next question is from Air Force veteran Dennis Britt, and Dennis asks, "What are the obstacles to allowing dental services to veterans?" In light of the current legislative pressure to add dental to Medicare benefits, VA eligibility for dental seems to be equally valid and a simple policy change directive. I think it's a great question. And first of all, I love the veteran's first name. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I kid. Um, it's an excellent question. Uh, I am very proud of the service that we offer for dental care at VA. Uh, we have great dentists on our direct on our team. They provide great direct care. We also refer a lot of care into the community. Um, and that care is also excellent. T uh, referrals seem to be going out pretty in a timely way. Billing is handled um, straightforwardly, also in a timely way. My only question about dental access is why we can't expand it. So I'm with the questioner. Um, to do so, we need some legislative relief from Congress. And so it's one of the things we're looking at. We've I've been having conversations with members on the Hill, um, uh, that is to say on Capitol Hill, 
members of Congress on Capitol Hill. Um, and um, in all cases, I think what we've seen is, especially in the context of this, of this latest debate of the President's Build Back Better agenda, is there's uniform recognition on Capitol Hill, House and Senate, uh, Republicans and Democrats, that the way we provide dental care is um, positive, should be emulated by the rest of the government. Um, and that's why I really want to find a way to expand it. I don't have news on that yet, but yeah. we're looking for ways to do it. Yeah. Thank you for, for yeah. going out there and fighting for it. I know Absolutely. it's really important for Absolutely. all of us. Absolutely. The next question comes from Army veteran Kara High. And Kara asks, when will the VA end the in-person requirements for veterans who are using the post-9-11 GI Bill to get their full housing stipend? It is antiquated and out of date in today's educational system. Yeah, like, um, I hear the frustration. The fact is this is one of the specific, you know, very specific pieces of uh, the law that we have to follow. Let me, let me just read it. It says, um, and this is in, um, I, I won't give you the, the specific citation, but it, re it requires us uh, to pay monthly housing allowance benefits at a reduced rate for individuals per pursuing a program solely through online education. New legislation would be required in order for VA to have authority to pay a different amount. And so the the question is, and we're looking at this, you know, can we get that legislative relief? But again, this is one of those things that um, we're going to need some help from Congress on. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's something my son's dealing with right now, too. He mentioned to me. So that was a great question for me to, to hear you have to say <laughs> what you said. <laughs> I love it. We were just talking about your son. And, yeah. Uh, uh, I, uh, the, I hope we find ourselves in a position with our friends on Capitol Hill. Um, I, I have a, my philosophy is to be very transparent with them, Republicans and Democrats. We don't really have secrets here. We don't run covert action. These are not national security secrets. Right. What we're doing here is all very, we should be very transparent about. And I hope our transparency about questions like this help us begin to get some relief from them on some of these questions and um, this, is a, this is a timely one uh, both for you and for the questioner but we've heard it from others as well um, and we're looking at ways to get it fixed. Yeah, thank you very yeah. much. The next question is from a surviving daughter, Ashlyn Haycock, and she asks, can you please tell us what the VA is doing to further expand its access to the vet centers both before a veteran's anticipated death due to illness and after an illness or sudden loss from suicide or other circumstances. What more do you have planned for the vet centers? Is there a way that survivors, such as myself, and the organizations that support us, like TAPS, can help VA and its vet centers further validate, normalize, and respond to help seeking behavior from survivor families, including children and youth? Yeah, that's a great question, and uh, I, first of all, I just want to say how much I admire um, TAPS, how much I admire uh, the perseverance, the strength um, of survivors, um, and I just want to say, the first thing I want to say in response to the questioner is, I, I so admire this question. I so admire the way you're looking, constantly looking for answers, and it's, it's a source of inspiration uh, for me and, and for so many I know. Um, that's the first point. The second point, I think the vet centers are a gem, absolute gem. If you are in almost any community across the country. You can get access to one of our veteran, sorry, one of our vet centers. There's 300 of them. Uh, storefront uh, providers of uh, mental health care services, trained counselors, 
overwhelmingly vets, including many combat vets. Mm -hmm. um, Congress has, well, so first and foremost, uh, you're uh, a combat vet. You're a vet suffering from PTSD. You're a survivor of MST. You come in the door, you'll get services. No questions asked. Congress is expanding, giving us uh, authority to expand those services, including in many cases to um, active duty or guardsmen and women who um, don't feel that they can get care um, in their current post. And we do offer bereavement services of the type that the questioner is asking about. Um, but let me take and uh, try to press to see if we can expand that, especially in the context of suicide, mm -hmm. death by suicide. Um, but I love that you asked about the vet centers. I, every time I travel, no matter where I go, I go and sit with the vet centers. Um, they've heard me hear this, they've heard me say this directly, but I'll say it again here. They're a source of great inspiration for me. Uh, and I want them to continue to do the great work they're doing um, and to continue to innovate. And we'll continue to look for additional resources for them. Yeah. The vet centers, as you mentioned, are storefront type of yep. uh, facilities. And what most veterans don't know is that they are away from the medical center for a reason. Yep. Right? They're there for them in the community. Yep. And uh, you're right. It is really a source of inspiration for yep. many of us. Yeah, the vet centers are great. Look, the history of the vet centers is that they really uh, sprang up in the late 1970s, Vietnam vets, who um, felt like going to VA to the med centers was too much of a hassle. So they, we tried to forward deploy those counselors, those professionals, into communities. And it's a really sound idea. Um, if you find that um, you're frustrated by your care at VA, at the med center, please contact our vet centers. And um, they're there for you. And they're an amazing bunch. Yeah, they are there for you, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The next question, sir, is from Navy veteran Stephen Esker. And he asks, why is that not a standard universal data system between locations? <laughs> this is one of those questions that is so logical. Yeah and such a straightforward question and the fact that we don't yet have this uh, fixed uh, is maddening. Um, but, you know, our data, actually, our uh, VHA data backbone uh, is, has over time been one of the country's most innovative. And um, frankly, we got there first and we pushed the rest of the industry to get there. And now we're trying to do something even a little bit more uh, robust, which is we're trying to make sure that we have uh, a workable data system across DOD into VA so that uh, when you transfer from active duty uh, to being a vet, that all your records transfer with. You don't have to carry them, get the file, and carry them over, hand them over to your doc. And uh, we're wrestling through that right now with the electronic medical records program. Um, and hopefully we'll be getting uh, that system deployed to the next set of locations to continue to test it out, to continue to refine it and improve it. But we're still working through a bunch of the um, bugs that we identified up in Spokane, mm -hmm. an unbelievably great group of
clinicians and practitioners up there in, v, in uh, the VA Med Center in Spokane who have been really wrestling with this new system. Um, so it's snagged, but we're get, getting it unsnagged, and we'll, uh, we'll be in a position to expand its access, uh, it, its operations soon. Um, but there's no question it's a good question, there's no question it's a logical question, and I hope that we'll be able to show in uh, the near to medium term some real progress on making that. Yeah, we're all excited about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Let me go to the next question for a Marine Corps veteran, anonymous Marine Corps veteran. He asks, or she asks, how can I get reimbursed for community care? Why does it take so long? What if I have to go to the emergency room? Yeah. So um, it's an excellent question. And I think we're, uh, yeah. as with all things, we're not perfect yet. Uh, so I'm not, I don't want to make an argument that we're perfect. Um, but um, we are improving. We're improving on the timeliness of the referrals. That's the moment you go talk to your uh, doc in the VA Med Center, uh, and she makes a referral uh, to community, to, for you to go get care in the community. Um, we're uh, reducing that time. It's not perfect yet, but we're reducing it. Uh, we're much better at the timeliness of payment. Uh, I know this is a source of frustration for many vets who have had um, incidences of care in the community uh, referred to uh, collections ag agencies because uh, the payment hasn't been made. Um, and if you find yourself in that situation, please make sure you're in touch with us and we'll help work through uh, these, uh, these cases. But specifically on emergency care, you have an option under the Mission Act to seek emergency care if you need emergency care. So if you need emergency care, you can seek it in the community. Remember, we have emergency departments in many communities too. And we're open for business. And so if you have an available option in your community to come into our emergency department, please do. But don't ever uh, stop yourself if, you find, if you're in emergency from going to an emergency room. You have that option in community care. But again, if you need an emergency room and there is VA medical center in your community, come in and see us. We'll take care of it. And I reiterate what I said in the, to the first question. If you find yourself in mental health crisis in an emergency, contact us through the Veteran Crisis Line or come to an emergency department and we'll get you seen today. We'll get you seen today. It's a very important uh, information that you gave. Yeah. Uh, asking questions, finding out what you're able to do, but more important, the crisis line number and how we have that available for veterans. And yeah. we'll put that on the end of the video today so that yeah. those folks out there watching have that for themselves uh, to pick up the phone and call if need be. The next question comes from a Marine Corps veteran, Matthew Lee. And Matthew asks, what is being done or what can the VA do to help homeless veterans? The numbers seem to be continuing to rise, and a large number of them are disabled veterans that need care, yeah. medications, and treatment. Yeah, that's a great question. Look, I, I start from this point, which is uh, there are certain phrases in the English language that shouldn't exist because they shouldn't, we shouldn't have to have a phrase to, to describe a situation that, in my view, shouldn't exist. And, the phrase homeless veteran is a phrase that shouldn't exist, mm -hmm. in my view. Mm -hmm. Not in this country, not in the greatest country in the history of the planet, not in the face, on, the fa on the face of the planet in the history of the planet. Not here. And surely not someone who raised their right hand and swore an oath to defend us. And so that's where I start. What can we do about it? One, we could do, and we are doing, uh, a series of concrete steps to prevent homelessness in the first instance. We talked a couple minutes ago about rental assistance if you find yourself in need. 
um, support for uh, your mortgage if you find yourself in need. Our VA-backed mortgages, uh, if you find yourself in need there, make sure you're in touch with us and we have, supporting, we have support for you there. So one, let's prevent veterans from being homeless in the first instance. Two, we have a robust effort underway because of funding from Congress uh, and from the President to ensure that veterans who are homeless get into supportive housing, transitional housing, sustainable housing. What we know is operating under a principle called housing first is the way that we can get ahead of this. Because when we get someone into housing first, we can then get that person supportive services, substance use disorder treatment, mental health care, help around joblessness or job training. If we get to the position where we have that person under a roof, we can help then address all of those issues that led to homelessness in the first mm -hmm. instance. How do we do that? Well, we get to know and we track down every individual veteran by name who's homeless and find out what they need. We're doing this today in LA where we have a, what we call Veterans Row right outside the West LA Med Center where we're working veteran by veteran to get them the care they need and get them into sustainable housing. That sustainable housing can take a lot of different forms. It can be emergency housing mm -hmm. for some short period. It can be transitional housing where you get mental health care and housing support. It can be a voucher where you get from the Housing and Urban Development and Veterans Affairs Departments monthly stipends to pay for your housing. We have a range of options. We have a proven way this works, and we have absolute commitment and urgency here to make sure it gets done. So if you're having trouble with housing, if you find yourself homeless, if you're on the verge of being homeless, please be in touch with us. We have support for you. We have proven ways to make this work and we won't rest until there are zero homeless vets in this country. Yeah, we have so many programs available to help. The next question is from Marine Corps veteran, Michael Gurl, and he asks, will veterans ever be able to obtain medical marijuana cards for pain issued by the VA? I know many vets that can benefit from this in dealing with pain, PTSD, instead of just pills. Yeah. Uh, it's a Great question, and it's a profound question. Um, it's one I hear on the road a lot. I, um, I had a very moving experience on uh, the Capitol Mall on Gold Star Mother's Day, where um, a vet came up to me and he said, I uh, want you to know I'm alive today because of this dog. He had a service dog with him. He said, and because of cannabis. And uh, it was very profound. Right now, we are limited by what we can do. We're limited in what we can do uh, related to cannabis and medical marijuana by the classification of um, marijuana as uh, a particular narcotic under the Controlled Substances Act. Um, we're trying to explore what more we can do. Um, and there is some, and I've, we've talked to our friends in the rest of the federal government, including the Department of Justice, on what we can do on this and with the White House. Um, I will be very honest. I, I come to this with um, views on marijuana, but at the end of the day, my personal views um, are not that important 
especially when I hear the testaments from so many of our veterans, like the amazing veteran I met on the mall. Um, and I'll be informed by the clinicians, our mental health professionals here at VA. So um, right now, under current law and current policy, we cannot be in a position to get those cards to veterans. Um, in order to get to a point where we would give those cards, we're going to need both a change of policy, which I'm looking at, as well as a change in law. Mm. Which brings me to my last point, which is I also think the questioner is absolutely right about this issue of an over-reliance on pharmaceuticals. And um, I think we've learned a lot of lessons in the last 10 years, and I think we're leading the way, frankly, in the country on how we can um, manage prescription drugs better and how we can develop alternatives to prescription drugs. And here's where I just want to underscore the importance of the whole health program, uh, which is being led by uh, Dr. Ben Kliegler um, and the amazing work that's happening in VA medical centers across the country, where we have access to opportunities for meditation, for yoga, for battlefield acupuncture, um, for acupuncture, so that for imaging, um, so that our veterans have access to non-pharmaceutical based pain management. Um, and so while we continue to work through this question on cannabis, what I'd ask our veterans to do is please talk to your provider about the whole health options. If you're worried about prescriptions, raise your concerns. You're right to raise them. Remember, we work for you. And let's make sure that we're addressing the range of options that our veterans um, No can work for them without falling into the trap on, on pharmaceuticals. Yeah. <clears throat> I know that's a really important subject for many veterans out there. Yeah. And thank you for addressing that and yeah. fighting for those veterans who yeah. find it uh, as an alternative for their health care. Definitely. Yeah. So the last question for you today is, what's been your most fulfilling moment uh, leading VA, and what has been your largest obstacle to improve trust with veterans? That's great. Two great questions. Um, I'll tell you, I was talking to a veteran the other day, very senior person. Uh, and he said something to me. He said, you know, Mr. Secretary, he said, uh, I haven't completely given up my track care, he said. But I love the care I'm getting at VA. I love the care I'm getting at VA. And this, as I said, senior vet, highly decorated. Um, like so many others, of our veterans, unassuming, even kind of wonders if you know going to VA means he's going to be taking something from somebody else. Maybe he doesn't deserve it. He got over those hurdles, as I hope everybody on screen with us today will, because we here, we're here for you, and your coming into care doesn't cost anybody else. We work for you. But to hear him say that, I was so proud. 
so proud of the care providers at that facility, which I know. Uh, I'm not going to name it for privacy of, of my buddy. But he has options, a lot of options, and he chooses VA. And that's so inspiring because it just says what VA is in so many places and what VA can be. All of these additional requirements we have, take the Mission Act. We had a couple of questions about care in the community. I want us to use the Mission Act to compete with private providers and for us to beat them so that our vets always choose us. And when I hear it, as I did on this video conversation just the other day, that this vet with options is choosing VA because of the care, because of the timeliness, that's the VA that is real life for so many others. And it's the VA that can be real life for everybody. That's the most inspiring thing. The biggest obstacle is veterans feeling, as some of these questions demonstrate, that they've tried and been let down. The question about the burn pit registry, the question about why does a vet in an emergency have to wait two months? All of those are real life experiences. And it's really hard to unring that bell. But what I see from our clinicians every day, what I see from the teammates here in VACO and VA central office, is people who want so badly to care for our vets. And I want us to overcome that trust deficit by ensuring that veterans see that. And not see it as it's spoken by me here, because talk is cheap. I want them to see it in the eyes of their providers as I see it. I want to see it in the eyes of their fellow veterans as I saw it on the screen the other day. Mm -hmm. I recognize that's hard, but to me this isn't a sociology exercise, this isn't politics. This is straight execution. We have the resources, we have the people, we have the strategy. It's now on us to execute. How many yeah. times do you find yourself as a Marine in that spot? Mm -hmm. Many times. Right. So it's on us now to do what you did countless times yeah. to execute. So I asked people to give us another look and we'll overcome that trust deficit because we work for you. I believe that. And what most veterans probably don't know is that you've been traveling to many facilities across the country, not just medical centers, vet centers, but also in the communities themselves. Yeah. And I know that you hear from veterans every time that you travel about the care that they're getting. Yeah. Um, but the wonderful care that they're receiving. Every day. Yeah. And it's, it's funny. A, a, a vet, sometimes it's, you know, it could be an older vet. Um, you know, inevitably it's been, uh, in this instance, the older vet's men. But I, I also hear this from women, although we have work to do with our women vets. I'll come back to that. They'll pull me aside and grab my arm and they'll kind of whisper. I say, hey. I just want you to know the care I get here. And they'll give me a doctor's name, from Dr. X or Dr. Y. Mm -hmm. It's the best care in the country. Now, on our women vets, we have work to do. Yeah. Too often still, a woman vet will want to go into her med center, but she'll be harassed just walking in the, the front door. So you know what we're going to do? We're going to make sure that we have a separate women's health pavilion as we do here at the DC Med Center with a separate entrance. It shouldn't have to be that way, but until we fix these problems, it's going to be that way. Mm -hmm. And we have to get better about the care we're giving to women's vets. Yeah. Right? That's how we get, that's what I mean, 
overcoming the trust deficit that we have is an execution challenge. I'm not asking anybody to buy any pigs and any pokes. I'm, I'm, I just want people to give us another shot. And let's see if we can execute our way to overcoming this trust deficit. Yeah. That's awesome. <clears throat> well, sir, I really want to thank you for taking the time out today, uh, for being with us, answering those questions from these veterans, their families, their caregivers and survivors. It truly means a lot to all of us. And again, thank you for your time. Thanks for having me, uh, Jose. You, you, we talked a little bit at the beginning about your family. Uh, you're a vet yourself. Your uh, son now a vet, your daughter. Uh, uh, not a vet. Um, I'll say no more. Um, <laughs> but you've given your whole life to us, to this country. Mm. And your kids are doing the same. And that's where we need to execute. So I appreciate you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We know many other questions were submitted through Rally Point, and responses were posted over the past week. If you are not already using VA services, please check out our VA Welcome Kit, Quick Start Guides, and subscribe to Vet Resources Newsletter. If you have a question about VA services and benefits, please call us at 1-800-MY-VA-411. That is our national toll-free number that serves as a front door to VA. Thank you for joining us. Have a great day, and happy Veterans Day, everyone.